want to welcome Alex. Uh, Alex Long is the uh, acting chairperson of our church council. Uh, how long have you been part of the congregation for, Alex? Uh, since the end of 2019. 2019, so Just almost four years. Yeah. Pre-COVID. Just pre-COVID, Just wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much for <coughs> agreeing to do this with us today. She's not Welcome. nervous at all. I'm so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I could, like, slide off this chair. Yeah. <laughs> I sweat. <laughs> so, let's begin, uh, at, with all good, as all good stories do, with the start, your origin story. Tell us a little bit about your childhood, your family, the things in early life that have shaped you. Sure. Um, so, I grew up uh, in the Sutherland Shire, which is, like, the whitest, straightest part of Sydney. Um, I had a really, I guess, a really good childhood, really typical, um, you know, white Australian middle class upbringing, mum and dad, my brother and me. Um, I'm the eldest, so I was um, bossy. And I loved school. Our family was, um, there was a lot of love. Um, There was a lot of chaos, equal measures of like love and dysfunction. Um, There was always people around, grandparents, aunties, uncles, cousins, family, friends, dogs, pets. Um, Yeah, my parents loved to um, socialise, so there was, yeah, there was always people around me uh, as a child. Um, Yeah, I think probably the things that really shaped me um, from a really young age, I was um, aware of... Uh, I guess, I I was social justice oriented and um, my dad always tells this through uh, an anecdote that when I was four years old, um, I told him off for telling off my brother um, and told him that he wasn't allowed to yell at him because he was little and I did this like by poking him and pointing at him. That doesn't sound like you at all, like it's it's (laughs) very foreign. Yeah, that's been my life ever since. <laughs> Just always <laughs> pointing at people. Um, yeah, I loved school, I loved learning, um, but I also struggled with um, anxiety when I was a kid. I had my first panic attack at age eight. Um, I didn't have any language to talk about it until I was 25, and then also discovered that my dad had had the same things. Um, so we'd had that shared experience, but never could communicate it with each other. Um, so, yeah, it was a pretty good childhood. And, and I know from your, your story that your connection with, with faith is a really wonderful and fascinating one, but as a, it wasn't really a faith story for you in sort of the early years, was it? It was more of a story of connect- some good and bad connections with religion, I guess, might be one way to describe it. Yeah, like religion was really practical. So um, my parents sent me to my brother and I to Sunday school, even though um, my dad is atheist and my mum is a non-practicing Church of England. But uh, Karangba Baptist Church um, offered Sunday school and they had a bus and they picked us up. So my parents, on a Sunday morning, probably hung over as hell, um, got a church to pick up their children and for three hours look after them and um, then drop them home. So that was Sunday school. I loved it because there was singing, food, Um, and other kids to play with, so I didn't mind, and um, my parents thought that, you know, a little bit of Jesus wouldn't hurt. Um, And I I think I was probably pretty fortunate. I know lots of people have pretty um, awful experiences with the church as children. Um, But I do... Dad tells this story that one day... um, there must have been, I don't know, maybe this is a thing with churches in the Sutherland Shire, but they all seem to have a bus and they all seem to pick up children, which is, like, ter- like frightening. But um, one day a bus came and parked outside our house and um, the doorbell rang. Oh, sorry, the doorbell didn't ring. Dad saw the bus, sent us out to the bus. We got on the bus, we went, and then about 10 minutes later another bus parked outside the house and when we didn't come out, then Vic, our bus driver, rang the door and said, like, where are Alex and Matt? And Dad was really confused because he'd already put us on the church bus. Um, so we went to some, I don't know, random church um, <laughs> and had, like, had fun. And um, they didn't seem to notice that we were like two random kids that they'd never seen without parents um, and then brought us home. So 
<laughs> you, you, you can't see, but I've got Christina in my eye line as our safe church person, and she is freaking out right now. It's wonderful. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we do so much better now with our <laughs> children. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I also went to, sun, uh, not Sunday school, um, we had kids club on a Wednesday afternoon. And again, it was um, competitive singing, supper, playing, um, and craft. So, like, if anyone knows me, these are all of my favorite things. So, I was just, like, I was really happy to just go along. And I wasn't really bothered about Jesus and God. And, yeah, I didn't give it much thought. And then, as I understand it, sort of as you moved into high school where those questions became a little bit more live for you and sort of as part of a uh, religious school, you, you went to a religious school, is that correct? I did, yeah. yeah. I went to a Presbyterian mm. ladies' mm. school for good ladies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah, and how did you kind of journey through that space? Because, again, that's a, that's a different kind of religious environment to operate in. Yeah. So I, I wasn't out when I was in high school. I had a really, um, I had a really strong sense that I was kind of a bit different, didn't quite fit in. Um, but religion in high school, again, it was kind of just, it was just there in the periphery. Um, it meant that we did a lot of, you know, Bible reading and we did, we sung a lot of hymns, which, you know, I kind of, you know, I enjoyed that aspect of it. Um, I enjoyed prayers because prayers were spiritual and I definitely you know, for a long time I had already connected with some kind of um, higher power, some kind of spirituality. I just didn't, I didn't know how to express it. I didn't have an avenue to express it that felt true mm. and felt like me. Um, Christianity for me in those days just felt like putting on, you know, a really wrong fitting kind of garment. Um, and you know, people who at high school were, were Christian, um, you know, were in a group called Crusaders, which, apologies, Christina, because I know you were a Crusader. <laughs> but I was like, Crusaders, like, the Crusades, I loved history. It was like, the Crusades seemed kind of bad. So I didn't really want to be a Crusader. Um, and the idea of crusading through life, you know, evangelizing um, just filled me with terror and, um, you know, thoughts of being socially ostracized, so it was definitely not for me. Um, and so, I mean, these, in, in your own words, describe yourself as a spiritual atheist teenager. Is that that's yeah. still fair to say? So we, we have a spiritual atheist teenager, and we skip forward a few years, and we have a chair of a church council. <laughs> Connect that, that, that for us. How wow. do we get from one of those to the other? Like, no one is more shocked <laughs> than I am. Um, so... I had looked for lots of different spiritual um, avenues and paths and, um, you know, I did meditation and yoga and um, I actually met um, my partner Corbin at a spiritual retreat um, for women and we were, it's uh, called Anandamaga and it's a kind of, um, I guess it's like a, a Hindu offshoot um, and it was run by this group of um, tie-dyed wearing um, lesbian ex Anandamaga nuns who'd been kind of ostracized for being too lesbian. So, um, you know, like I certainly fit in culturally there um, and I, I did love it. And, um, you know, there was a lot of singing and meditation and community and it was, it was really a beautiful time and, you know, it, it led me to Corbin and um, a group of women who I still like deeply love and respect. Um, but I felt like it was still a bit isolating because we would come together, you know, maybe monthly um, and then a couple of times a year for these spiritual retreats. And, and that was kind of it. There wasn't, um, I didn't feel like there was a daily practice or a communal, you know, practice that was regular. Um, and it also seemed really focused on, you know, your internal transformation as a human rather than how do we you know, build community, how do we do justice, um, which is like on <laughs> the T-shirt. Um, yeah, it wasn't community connected in that sense. So um, one night we were, uh, you know, sitting in bed reading and talking about this sort of conundrum and Corbin said like, well, why don't we, why don't we like try another path? Like, what about church? And like that 
it was, I was like, wow, really? Like, you would even consider that? Um, I only knew of one possible church. I knew um, a lot of us know David Barrow. He's part of our community. He's online at the moment too. Oh, Hi, Dave. <laughs> Um, so, I knew David from community organising and, um, you know, like, he's one of the queerest people I know and he also went to church and I thought, well, if he can make those two seemingly incongruous things go together, then maybe where he goes to church, I might be able to find something there. Mm. Um, and, yeah, we rocked up one October 2019, we were greeted at the door by... Liam, who is also, like, the gayest man I've ever met, was wearing a rainbow crocheted floor-length cardigan that I think actually Robin Goodhill had crocheted him. Seems fair, yeah. yeah. Um, and he greeted us and, like, sort of skipped over to us and was like, welcome, welcome home. And I thought, oh, my God, this place is, like, this is my people. Um, so that's kind of how we mm. arrived. Um, how I became chairperson, well, that's... A bit longer. That's a longer story. <laughs> All right, from from the hearing this story before, there was an important moment, or well, a couple of important moments in that first service that kind of captured your captured your heart and your attention. What, tell us a little bit more yeah. about those. Well, actually, so um, what happened on the very first time I came here, and it's something that um, you will all get to participate in today, um, was communion. And, you know, I grew up with um, Catholic cousins, so I did, I went to a lot of Catholic masses as a child, um, and I also taught in a Catholic high school. And, you know, the Catholics, they do, like, incredible rituals. I love, I love all the rituals, but also they are very, it, it was really exclusive. So as a child, all my cousins would, like, walk up to get communion, and I would have to sit in the pews. When I was in high school, oh, sorry, when I taught in high school, um, I, I had to have communion, but because I wasn't concerned, I had to walk up to the front of the church with all of my students' eyes on me, and I had to, like, cross my arms. And I used to, I used to hate it. I mean, I used to love it and hate it. I, I wanted to be part of it so much, um, but I was excluded from it. So when we first came to Luck and Radhika was doing communion and she said, you know, this table is for everyone, without exception. And I was, I was so shocked and so elated that for the first time in my life, um, I, could, I could have communion. And it was a really transformative experience and taught me that the power of inclusion is, there is nothing more powerful than welcoming and including others. Um, and I just think if people knew what that could do, like from that moment, that was really what solidified coming back. I mm. think if I'd had, you know, a bad experience of being excluded so early on, then, you know, I probably wouldn't have come back. Mm. So that's that's kind of, a, in one sense, the start of the, for want of a better word, the Christian faith journey for you, that point of coming into this place. What does that, what does that mean for you now? What does the concept of faith mean for you or do for you? How do you, how do you think about it? So... I, I want to imagine that my faith is expansive um, and also that it has integrity. Um, I guess what that means for me is that faith can have all sorts of different expressions. So part of my faith is to be part of this community, um, to go to our small group, which is you know often the highlight of my week. Um, it... It means having, um, you know, daily conversation with God. Um, it also, for me, um, and this is something that, you know, some people know and some people don't, but I've been part of a 12-step fellowship for the last about two years, um, and that's around uh, people who have uh, compulsive eating and disordered eating. And that program... Um, if anyone is familiar with 12-step, um, part of that is to acknowledge that a power greater than yourself can restore you to sanity. And that's really um, important for me because it means that there is something out there 
something bigger than me, something way more powerful than me. Um, and it also means that if I want to, you know, be free of my addiction and my illness, then I have to be in constant contact with God every minute of the day. And sometimes it means, you know, being, you know, asking for help, um, you know, at every meal or, at, you know, every time I'm confronted with, with food, I have to, um, I have to let go of my ego and let go of my, this thought that my willpower is enough. It is, it's not enough. Mm. And I have to give over control to God. And that's, that's really hard because I think we all like to be in control, mm. but ultimately we're not. Mm. And I have to trust that God is enough. You, yeah, I mean, we are, we've we been so grateful for uh, both you and Corbin's presence with us here and, and gifted so much to us in this space. Um, you've, you've been part of a number of committees and groups in helping lead this church and have more recently uh, stepped into a, a void of being our, our chair, uh, church council chair. What's, what's your vision for this community? What do you see is here already and what do you hope for the future for this community? Um, I hope that luck is a place of healing um, for us as individuals, but also us as a community and us enacting healing on the community. The, the profound um, truth for me of the Bible is that it is it's profoundly non-violent. It's Jesus' message is to love others as you would have them love you or as you love yourself. And I think for a lot of us, we really struggle with loving ourselves. We, we don't know how to do that. Mm. So faith for me is part of, you know, learning to love myself and healing all of, you know, our many traumas um, so that we can go out into the world and not do harm and to actively heal others, heal our institutions, heal our environments, you know, heal our planet. Mm. Um, and I hope that you know, luck can be a part of that. I think, you know, I look around me and this is like just the most glorious rainbow church I've ever seen. I never imagined that a church could be like this. And I hope that, you know, this place is a place of healing so that when we go out into the world, we are healing others mm. and being, um, yeah, being non-violent and not just passively non-violent, but actively non-violent. Um, that's what I hope for luck. Mm. Do you have any uh, key memories over the last three or four years of this community that sort of stand out to you as this is luck at its best? <laughs> um, uh, yes and no. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> All of them. All of them. <laughs> so many. Yeah. Look... The nativity play is, is pretty outrageous. Uh, it's, you know, profoundly anti-racist, anti-capitalist. It's queer. It's glorious. It's wacky. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, so I think, you know, that, that kind of, for me, represents a lot of what luck is. Like, faith can be joyful. Um, it's, it doesn't have to be all, you know, sad and doom and gloom and, you know, we've sinned and self-flagellation. Like, faith is actually really glorious and joyful. Um, I think, you know, luck does that very well. Mm. But also, I love that we are, I hope, a church that, you know, holds a mirror up to ourselves and says, what are the bits that are beautiful? And also, what are the bits that we can do better? Mm. How can we be more anti-racist? How can we be more queer affirming? How can we be more accessible um, for people who, you know, are differently abled or who are neurodiverse? And, and in a way that is genuine and is willing to wrestle with, you know, the hard bits, even if it means that we have to, you know, make changes that are hard and make changes that mm, we don't always like or feel comfortable. Mm. 
there are uh, two parts of a tapestry of faith that we, d we do each time, uh, and, and in this case we're grouping them together, and you'll, you'll see why shortly. Uh, but uh, the first one is we invite uh, the, the person that we're interviewing to provide the Bible reading, uh, uh, and uh, you have a, a I guess it's, it's kind of you've chose it, you kind of chose it, uh, but tell a little bit more <laughs> how, how we got to hearing this text today mm. um, as part of our yeah. story. So I was actually supposed to preach today. But um, I, I've preached once before, which was, you know, great, and I, I loved it, but it was also um, in excruciating. It was so hard. Not the actual preaching part, because I'm a sort of extroverted public speaker, so I'm happy to, but the process of preaching and, and grappling with the text was really hard. So when I realised that actually I didn't want to do it again, I thought, how could I hmm. wheedle my way <laughs> into doing something <laughs> And you were supposed to do this a while ago, weren't I you? I was, yeah, so I was like, oh, surely this is this will be enough. Yeah. This is this sort of ticks the box. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but you did have the option to change the reading, but I you, did, you, you, but you I didn't chose it. because yeah. Radhika said, like, are you what text do you want to preach on? And I looked at the lectionary, and it was the text on miracles, which I was just like, oh my god, like why? Because this is like miracles are kind of like one of many. Mm. Let's be honest, one one of many things about the Bible that I just think, what? Like, that is just, it's really, is it like a magic trick? Is it, like, I just don't get it. I find it really difficult to grapple with the concept of miracles. Um, but I also think that, you know, the Bible isn't like a pick and mix. It's, it's a whole text, and I don't have to like all of the parts of it. So when I decided that I was going to preach, I was like, well, this is, this is the lectionary. This is what I've been given. So, you know... It might be a lemon, but, you know, make some lemonade out of it. Um, so that's why I stuck with it. <laughs> and Yeah, and I think that's, that's important that we, we hold... Yeah, we don't just pick the bits that we like, that we actually try and engage with, with the whole thing yeah. and see what it might have to teach us, even if we come to it with more questions and answers that we get, I think is really yeah. important. And there's, like, a whole lesson about... I mean, I could have gone and... and, and become okay with miracles and there's so much in that text that um you know teaches us about community and sharing and faith and you know even that miracles you know do exist even if you know it's not about you know fish and bread mm. and so if you do want to uh delve a little bit more deeply into that story you're very welcome to join us tonight where matt powell will be preaching on that text and and similarly asking a whole lot of questions about uh, what this text means for us, so join us then if you can. We always end uh, with the, w the one question uh, of this, this time, and this question is, uh, if you were to meet God face to face right now, what would you ask God? Yeah, so I was going to ask God about miracles, but, oh, I'm, yeah. <laughs> but I'm actually not, because um, I was thinking the other day that I was looking at a picture of the solar system, and, you know, like, Earth is in the middle of our sort of all of the planets, there's the sun, Earth is in the middle. And it's so beautiful, but any closer to the sun and we would burn, any further away from the sun and we would freeze and there would be no human life. But we are one solar system in, and correct me if I'm wrong, but billions, billions and billions of solar Corbin systems. Corbin said lots. Lots, so many lots of solar systems in our universe. And I, I'm kind of like, Surely, we, we are not the only, you know, life form in this universe. Mm. And so my question to God would be, are we or mm. are we not? Mm. Um, and if we're not, which I assume we're not, where are they? Mm. <laughs> and, you know, what do they look like? And mm. will we ever meet them? Mm. That would be my question. Cool. So now, that, now that's the question you all have too, I believe. You're all, you'll be thinking <laughs> about that as well. Um, I'm sure that you, all, you would all have many, many more questions for Alex. And unfortunately, due to time, we can't sort of do that right now. But Alex is very lovely. So uh, if you wanted to ask them through yourself, she'd be really happy to chat with you after the service. Um, uh, but can we just take a moment now to, to thank Alex uh, for sharing with us this morning? And as we uh, close, I might pray for Alex, and then we'll share in the response from the screen. So let us pray. 
Gracious and loving God, we are so grateful uh, for the gift that Alex is to this community. Uh, we give thanks for uh, her journey, uh, for what she shared with us today. We give thanks for the joy and uh, experience that she brings to this community. We give thanks to all the ways in which her gifts are used in this place. And we ask your blessing on her uh, for the future as she uh, works uh, with the Wayside Chapel as she continues to lead in this community and for all that she does in her life. We ask blessing on her and on Cor Corbin and we give thanks for the blessing that she is to us. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>